is Frontera, California, home of the California Institute for Women, the largest women's prison in California. Leslie Van Houten has spent the last 12 years here. She's doing her time in rooms like this one. Van Houten is in medium custody, the lowest security level allowed as a first-degree murderer. These surroundings are a long way from what a young Leslie Van Houten experienced as a middle-class teenager in Altadena, California. But the parole board doesn't much care where Leslie Van Houten came from. More important is how far she has come since she has been in prison. Offenders from the life crime? No, absolutely not. Having finished the formal questioning, Commissioner Guadarrama then opens the floor to the board, beginning with a few questions of his own. Uh, back when you talked to the probation officer, uh, said with reference to the present offense, the defendant queried, what's to say about it when they were, you were discussing the crime? I didn't kill anybody. The only reason I feel I'm sentenced to death because I didn't talk against Charlie. I think he's a decent man. Uh, could you comment on that statement you made? Yeah, I, um, back then I did. You know, I feel that I was still very um, hooked into him and his philosophies, and I defended him. How do you feel about him? I feel that he's a very pitiful and pathetic human being, and that um, I'm very sorry that people still continue to give him attention that his only danger is in the attention he's given. If he were ignored and left alone, he would um, probably just fade away. Deputy Commissioner Monica Smith elicits some surprisingly personal revelations from Van Houten about her initial enchantment and then growing disenchantment with Charles Manson. In your initial evaluations, your psychological evaluations, May 1971, you were saying that uh, you were rationalizing regarding your behavior and saying that people get killed in Vietnam, what's the difference you fed these people yes. and, and uh, saying that you felt that you did something right. Yes. Have you gained some insight into why you held those beliefs? Yes. Would you like to share that, that with us? I, I believe that because I believe that Manson was Jesus Christ and that it was something that had to be done and that... Um, while it was not something that I felt good about or uh, that it was like war and we were going through combat training at the ranch and um, really prepped like that. And your belief system led you to believe that someone who was Jesus Christ would instigate racial wars between blacks and whites? Yeah, he said that it was the blacks' turn, that the white had been on top for too long, and all they ever did was put harm on other people that were not like them, and that the last time he came, he had been crucified, and this time he would have to make himself known. When was it, how long ago was it, that you discovered that that was not the proper way to think? Well, probably about 18 years ago. How have you dealt with that issue, that whole it's issue? It's been very hard for me. It hasn't been until the last couple years that I've even been able to consider that um, well, this sounds kind of foolish, but that I could be forgiven by God for what I had done. Part of my job at the ranch when Charlie would be in the tub was to read from him, to him from the Bible. And it's been a very difficult thing for me to um, find forgiveness spiritually. And um, I, I guess I felt that I had gotten into this mess on my own. And AA talks a lot about God as we understand him and turning our will over and removing defects of character and <coughs> the more I studied AA and A and A um, realized that I needed to find some sort of peace. 
with what had happened and not just the crime but life at the ranch and Manson in general and what he had done or the effect he had had over me and um, I've been able to particularly with Carl in the last two years my minister find a renewal of a loving God and Seek peace. Leslie Van. As I mentioned a couple times in the reading of this decision, is very heinous. And uh, you dug yourself quite a hole and it's going to take a little time to, uh, to get out of it. Awesome. So, any comments from uh, Commissioner Cito? I'm good to see you again. It's nice to see you too. Mr. Smith? I wish you good luck. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank that you. concludes the sir. All right, thank you. The goodbyes are strikingly civil, but the California Parole Board decision is definitive. Once again, Leslie Van Houten has been denied parole. She will be eligible again in two years. I am disappointed. Uh, I thought we had a much better case. It seems to be reflected by the hearing panel's decision. But we will appeal and appeal and uh, pursue the matter in court. And if that fails, we'll be back here in two years. Well, I'm very pleased. Uh, uh, the main thing for me to get is a uh, finding of unsuitability because once they find her suitable, then we start talking about the number of years, and once they give her a number of years, it always gets whittled down for good time and work time. And so as long as I can keep away from that, I'm very happy. As Leslie Van Houten heads back to prison, her attorney questions how the board came to its conclusion. A crucial part of this case is how much time the parole board envisions uh, for her to do. In other words, what is her total term before she's paroled? And I think we have a difference of opinion about how the parole board's regulations apply. I think they're interpreting the rules in, in a way which is much different from mine for some reason, uh, given their decision. Perhaps that will have to be decided in court at some point. Uh, what her attorney said is ridiculous. I mean, it's the absolute uh, minimum and doesn't apply to any crime like this. As a matter of fact, the uh, by the uh, rules, the board doesn't even have to go by the matrix uh, for a crime such as this. They can create their own matrix. And certainly the, uh, the La Bianca murders would be off the board. In fact, Kay has a point. The matrix or formula used by the parole board is a guideline only. That means no matter how much Leslie Van Houten has reformed, the board is still within its authority to turn down her parole. I think she, she has great strength as an individual. I don't think she'll have any difficulty continuing to live as she has and programming as she has. Uh, if she is eventually found suitable, it will be principally through her own efforts, and I think she will be. But... Oh, I think if any of them ever get paroled, that she will probably uh, be the first, but uh, uh, it's certainly going to be over my objection. Thank you. Ms. Van Yes. Um, I have a closing comments that I would like to make. I don't believe that um, some of the things that Mr. K has said are things that are part of the record, but I also don't want to um, begin picking. Is it necessary that I, I've done a lot of reading on I would as say much that legal work? That would be sufficient. Yeah, you don't have to do that. Okay, okay. As far as the where the drink milk was drank, why I changed my clothes. Certainly, um, I will be the first to admit that this was a cruel and callous and dispassionate crime, which is basically why I'm found unsuitable, and it's the one thing that I, I can never change. I would like to point out that there are what I feel certain circumstances that allow me to be able to sit in front of you and hope that someday I will be released. And one of those is that I feel that in my trials, my second and third trials, there was a great deal of testimony by psychiatrists that led enough to a defense that the second trial was hung for 30 days, five manslaughter and seven first. It was when in my third trial felony murder, which is robbery murder, was read. There were four separate instru instructions requested by the people. They were read to the jury. The felony murder, robbery murder, states that my state of mind at the time of the crime negates 
in other words, because it's a robbery, my state of the mi my state of mind at the time is not important. And Mr. K in the past has even said in this room that he agrees a hundred percent that it was not a robbery. So I believe that the psychiatric testimony that offered that I was not as capable as I am today in 1969 is one reason that I could be considered for parole without diminishing the fact that these were horrible acts that were committed. The second thing is that the crime was committed during an unusual period of time not to reoccur. I was 19, I was a drifting hippie already with a history of using marijuana. I ran into a man who had just gotten out of prison, was very seasoned, and enjoyed using people. I've worked very hard in my therapy to understand that relationship and to move on from it. The third thing is that during the committing of the crime that I was under extreme mental stress. And if there's been any evidence at all or understanding of abusive relationships and cults, there was extreme stress at that time in my life. The autopsy report verifies that there were superficial stab wounds in the lower back of Mrs. LaBianca. I have consistently testified and taken um, responsibility for those. The district attorney's office never presented any evidence that would refute what I have said. And so it's a matter of I believe my consistency long before I ever heard of an autopsy report or anything else, that those wounds were post-mortem and they were at the lower, lower torso. So any reference to other wounds, there's been no evidence to that. Um, for suitability, I believe that I qualify under no juvenile record. As you mentioned, all my crime activity occurred with Manson. I today have a stable social history. When you read over the letters, a great many of those people I have known either all my life or at least 15, 16 years, they're um, good people, they care about me, and they've helped me become who I am today. I lean on them and they are uh, decent people. Signs of remorse, I, I feel that my life is a sign of remorse. I certainly take seriously what I have done. And it goes on. I, when I see youthful violence on television, it breaks my heart. There is nothing, and this is an almost a cliche, I'm sure, said by people in this seat, that there's nothing I can do to change the past. Certainly there is not. But I would hope that you would understand that I took the wreckage and I have tried to become a person that is um, uh, contributing. Not, not only could I be contributing in, in that community if you let me go there, but certainly I'm also in this community and I see that as part of my remorse and an expression of it. Um, I talked about the motive. I have no violent history of violent crimes. As I said before, August 10th, 1969 was it. Any kind of um, suggestion that I have a suppression. Signs of remorse, I, I feel that my life is a sign of remorse. I certainly take seriously what I have done. And it goes on. I, when I see youthful violence on television, it breaks my heart. There is nothing, and this is an almost a cliche, I'm sure, said by people in this seat, that there's nothing I can do to change the past. Certainly there is not. But I would hope that you would understand that I took the wreckage and I have tried to become a person that is um, uh, contributing. Not, not only could I be contributing in, in that community if you let me go there, but certainly I'm also in this community and I see that as part of my remorse and an expression of it. Um, I talked about the motive. I have no violent history of violent crimes. As I said before, August 10th, 1969 was it. 
any kind of um, suggestion that I have a suppressed anger. I live in a very, very difficult environment. And if any of you, I don't know your histories, but if you're all familiar with the CDC, even the uh, gentlest of prisons, which I think this one is probably one of them, there's any number of ways to lose your temper, become frustrated, and at some point show if there was a, a tendency to blow up. It certainly would have blown up in the last 29 years. I live in an environment that I have had to learn lots of coping skills. I feel that my age speaks for itself. I was 19 when the crime happened. I'm 48 now. <coughs> I'm getting very dry. Is there some water? <coughs> anyway, my age speaks for itself. No one at 48 is the same as they were at 19. And, um, as I stated before, the older I get, the more difficult it is to live with what I did. I don't ever believe that, thank you, there will come a time in my life, whether I'm in here or I'm in the community, where I'm not acutely aware of what I did. I will live with that forever. And I've learned how to live with it in the best way I know how. I believe my pro plans are realistic. I believe they're humble, and they are ones that I can meet. And my prison record, it speaks for itself. Oh, okay. Are you still rolling? Okay, fine. You can walk. Just walk in and sit down. Okay, go. Okay, ma'am. This is, is tomorrow and not today, right? Hello, I'm still in the line. Yes, um, the main reason for my running away was because of my uh, amount of um, participation in dropping uh, acid. And I started when I was about 16, and I could... Uh, at the beginning, I could still live going to school and um, more or less living within the structure of society. But the more I dropped acid, the harder it was to relate to uh, different, uh, different people other than the other people that were dropping acid. And so slowly, you know, it was like all of the hippies were migrating to areas where they felt comfortable with one another. About it, could it have been other children? I think at the time it could have been a lot of other children. I, I've had a lot of different women I've met that have been inside that have told me that they were really glad that they didn't run into Charlie because they too would have been there. You know, it was... Uh, I, don't, I don't feel like uh, I was any different in that way. I think a lot of parents also were concerned with the idea that it could have been their children. Oh, I was taking LSD. I had been traveling around with a couple other people I had met up in San Francisco. Uh, I had had a breakup with my first boyfriend, and when you're young and very much in love, the breakup can be really difficult. So. I was trying to make it on my own in San Francisco and I wasn't able to. So a couple people came by and said, well, come with us. And uh, it was kind of a live for today and, you know, we'll deal with tomorrow when it gets here situation. So I went ahead and went with them. And from there, I ended up going to Spawn's Ranch. And then uh, we left for a little while and then I went back because I was having trouble with the guy I was with then. Not every day, but at least a couple times a week. 
Yes, and see, the thing is, is um, when you drop acid at first, it's a nine-hour experience, and then at first you can go and you can go back to work on Monday or whatever, but the more you take it, the more you become lost in what, uh, why you're on acid is real, and the less you're able to relate to others. So the more I became isolated from people with contrary viewpoints, the more I became totally immersed, you know, in the acid reality, and it's, uh, it's a fairy tale world. When I first met him, he was uh, kind of upset that I was there because I had been with a friend of his and he was frightened that my being or staying at the ranch would come between him and this other fellow. But on the whole, he was a very uh, dominant person. Uh, sometimes he was nice and sometimes he wasn't. More than anything else, though, he was the only one that any of us ever felt knew that he knew what he was doing. And when we, would, when we would take the um, acid, we would take it with a lot of us together, and then he would um, speak to us and uh, move with his gestures and uh, more or less, he, he never told us, you know, that was one of his things. He always made sure to never tell us anything. He would suggest things. But, it was understood if you didn't go with the suggestion, you wouldn't be, you know, in his good graces. But, uh, what? Well, a lot of the... I guess so. I admired him and I, I really became dependent on him and his... Uh, moods of the day and uh, he what he would well some of the girls see would suggest to other people that he was Jesus Christ and then what he would do is he'd go on a big thing about how he didn't want anyone to call him Jesus Christ because you know they crucified him so in a way I think that uh, he would have you know feed it to certain people who would give it to others and then deny it you know do you understand what I'm saying well Charlie was always very careful that no one could put definite things on him, that he always protected himself in different ways. I think that at one point I really believed he was Jesus Christ. Yes, you know, uh, no. We uh, went to bed together a couple times, but, you know, I didn't consider him a lover. I, huh? Oh, that's all right, I forgot what I was going to say. Well, I feel uh, like I was a pawn in whatever his uh, scheme was. Uh, I'm glad that I will never again have to see him. And... I try not to uh, hold a lot of hatred for him because to me if you hate someone that's also having a lot of emotions and I'm trying to put it into myself that that was just a part of my life that's gone and I'm trying to uh, keep, you know, to be able to live from that point on without uh, letting him even more or less have an influence on me and my hatred for him. Oh, I, uh, I believe that he won't ever be out. And from what I understand, uh, he's comfortable there. And uh, I think that's what should happen. I, uh-huh. Yes? No. Yes, I remember it. But, uh, huh? I was just going to tell you that I'm not able to speak of it right now. Yes.
at that time, we, we had been isolated for so long from other people. The people at the Spahn's ranch didn't leave unless certain people were chosen to go downtown for the day to get food or whatever. Uh, it became a condensed amount of uh, group programming and thinking. And at the time, it was supposed to help people. And the, the crimes, they were supposed... It was supposed to start a revolution that would uh, clean the souls of everyone. And see, what Charlie would do is he would speak about people's souls and not their persons. And because we weren't tuned in enough, we couldn't see what he was talking about, so we would just have to take his word for it. And uh, that's, you know, that's what he said, that that next summer there would be this big revolution and that the chosen people would live in a hole in the middle of the desert. And then after the crimes, we went out and looked for the hole. Well, I had been taught then that there was no such thing as death. And it's hard for me to speak of it now because uh, I'm, I'm back to my normal way of thinking and uh, now I can't conceive of it but back then uh, back then it wasn't supposed to mean anything death wasn't to mean anything yes I, I have a lot of remorse I uh, The, it's something that I know I'll be living with the rest of my life and uh, I'm very sorry. Well, right now I, uh, I hope that if or when I do get out that I can become more involved in some kind of a career because I really uh, I feel like right now I wouldn't want to have a child because I wouldn't want to subject them to my past. I, I don't think it would be fair and uh, I don't think there would be any way for the child not to be uh, bruised by it. Well, when I first got there I was on death row. And the only people we could write at that point in time was my, uh, our immediate families, each of us. And for about two years, we could only write immediate family and um, people that, like I had known prior. So those were my old high school friends. And um, they all started uh, talking with me and trying to uh, help me uh, start seeing things the way they properly are. And uh, after the death penalty was abolished, I was, um, uh, I, I stayed in that unit for another, well, I ended up doing about four and a half years in um, isolation with my co-defendants. And I had a good psychiatrist that came back and spoke to me just about every day and like I say, my family and my friends were really good about helping me to uh, reorganize myself. And then the institution let some classes start coming in. And I remember my first class was a women's lib class. And uh, that helped me to start thinking because prior to that, it had always been this male, you know, uh, king kind of thing. And uh, after we talked for a while, I really started to... Uh, be able to understand that I could be my own person. That was, the, that was the biggest struggle, that I could think independently, because living at the ranch, we were taught never to think independently. It always had to be what others would think, or not to question something. And when I realized that I could, it was like a, a whole new world was opened up. And so then I began to get into college, and I have done some writing 
And uh, after that, I moved on to the main population and I was editor of the paper there. But, no, I don't write poetry. My poetry is terrible. I write uh, short stories and um, I wrote a novella about the county jail. Yes, it was, uh-huh. We had romance and uh, we still write, but the idea of being married right now, I, uh, I don't know, I think that I, the proper thing to do would be to uh, see do we enjoy each other as much in person as we did in letters. Oh, we met, but meeting someone and being around them all the time are two different things, I think. He works uh, in his own publishing company now. He publishes prisoners' works. I think that that's the image I was trying to portray to him. Uh, after the trial started, Charlie suggested that we try to, we meaning the three women, try to carry the load of the case so that he could be released, you know, so that he could further carry on his works to save the world. And, uh, which um, I would like to tell you right now, I, you know, I see it completely different right now. Um, but to me, at that point, to act strong or something meant to act like a, a real toughie. And I think that I went out of my way to try to show Dr. Hockman a, a rough, you know, prisoner kind of exterior. Yes. Um, Charlie suggested that we did. Uh, one of the girls that was on the corner had left and he was quite upset and said that because she had left and not shaved her head that that meant thousands of people wouldn't be saved. And so, you know, when he said to do it, I didn't want to be held responsible for thousands of more people not being saved, so I did. And the same with the ex, you know, I, I really don't have any idea at all. He said it was because we were exing ourselves from society. Yes. The scar is, I, uh, huh? Uh, sort of, but it's not real clear anymore. I'm going to have it removed whenever uh, I can get, you know, plastic surgery. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if you can. Can you? Yeah. I, I, I honestly believe, you know, uh, it took me a good two years to even um, begin to uh, realize what had happened and what I had been through. To, uh, it took years to be able to start uh, sorting out my mind and my thoughts and putting things in their proper perspective. And then at one point I was able to start writing a couple of the women that were out. This was about three years ago. And I, I was still thinking that I was... Uh, believing like they were and it wasn't until I wrote them a few letters that I realized how much I'd grown from it and then reading you know their their philosophies and things I, I couldn't even relate anymore I I had to quit writing them I couldn't I couldn't uh, I couldn't reach them with where I was at and they were feeling very cheated that I no longer was uh, co-signing their little uh, beliefs I, uh, it's been a very um, hard fight for me. I, I've uh, worked hard to try and answer things that I thought uh, or have been extremely painful for me. Uh, like I said, I was very lucky that I had a really good psychiatrist that came around a lot. And 
I think that I've put myself back together, you know, pretty well. I feel good about myself now. And uh, that whole year of living with him and the year of the, of the trial, it's, it's hard for me to even uh, uh, see myself there any longer. You, huh? No, I'm done. Oh yeah, she lived at the ranch. No, I didn't. Uh, before that, uh, they had been sending letters in to the institution, which I wasn't receiving because I had, you know, written out a slip saying I didn't want to hear from them ever again. And they were getting uh, angry, and they called up one of the attorneys and said, uh, Sandy and Lynn, and, oh, Squeaky Frome and Sandra Good. Yes, they were angry at me because I, I was uh, not, you know, actively co-signing things that they were doing. They knew, they knew that I wasn't being with them anymore. And they uh, called up one of the attorneys, and I was still in isolation at the time. And they said that uh, they knew if they did things that it meant that I would stay in isolation. And if I didn't, you know, make movements to... Uh, show my loyalty to them, they would continue to do things to make sure that I never got out of isolation. So I figured something was happening, but uh, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know what they had in mind or that it was going to happen. No, I don't think that I was that important to her, but... Uh, I figured something was up when they were so um, adamant about us, meaning myself and the other, co you know, my co-defendants, uh, co-signing themselves. It almost got to be a trend that if there was something that ugly was going to happen, that suddenly they'd involve the three of us, you know. So uh, I, I don't know why she did it, and I don't know. Uh, she said she did it for the Redwoods, but, you know, I don't know. And... Uh, I, you know, I didn't know she was going to do it. Not that she would do that particular act, but um, I felt that the uh, certain authorities thought something was up because all of a sudden uh, I was receiving all of these letters that were really uh, kind of uh, demanding that I get in touch with them. Oh, yeah, they, they went through my mail. Um, I, I feel glad that we're all separated. And I, I hope that uh, they, too, will be and are able to uh, sort out their lives. Well, I, I really want to eventually just be able to have my own complete life with a, a new name and uh, just be able to uh, not have to be reminded of it. And I, you know, I don't have a desire to be in touch with anyone that I knew then in the future. Yes, I... I think that each of us, you know, is working to. Yes. I, I said that because um, I couldn't... My mother and I, it's... You just can't tell your mother you're never going to, you know, be free. I, I said that more for her to have hope than uh, actually believing it. We have a very good relationship. My mother has come to visit me every week for seven years now, and uh, we've gotten extremely close. 
and my father lives out of state, so I see him a couple times a year. He stayed in L.A. until my trial was over, and then he moved out of state. Uh, I have a very close family ties now, and uh, they've all been extremely supportive, but they haven't been uh, weak to me either. Uh, I'm talking about like in the uh, in my early years of confinement, they were uh, very strong and uh, at times very hard on me to help me, you know, get my my thoughts situated again. It's you know, it's it was a very uh, they're they're really wonderful people. I know that, that there are many that feel that way, and uh, I can understand their feelings. If I'm released or if I am given parole, it will be because um, I feel like with this new trial, I feel like now I will be able to go back and uh, tell the truth which I, I didn't then, because in my opinion, the courtroom was just a follow-up of the crimes. You know, Charlie was conducting the courtroom. Uh, well, he was telling us what to say, you know, uh, when to stand up, you know, when to carve the X, when to shave our heads. Every day it was like a new agenda on what we should do for the day. Um, for the people that feel that, I should. I feel like if I am released, it will be because I deserved it. And if I'm not, then I, you know, I'll be able to handle that also. Then I go back to the institution and I, I try for parole and uh, continue my you know, uh, life at the institution. He was, uh, he presented himself to be a very free person that was free of a lot of inhibition. And for many of us, we were brought up in a, regimented type, uh, middle class, uh, you know, background. Uh, with the acid, we were regressing into uh, younger years of wanting to play in the dirt practically and wear flowers and all that kind of thing. He was almost at times like a Pied Piper. When I first met him, he was different than when the crimes were committed. But it happened in a slow, a slow evolving and like I say, it's only been since I've been able to sit back years later and analyze, you know, what it was myself that I can speak like this. But he had a, a way with words. Um, he could be completely unpredictable, and he'd use that in different ways. He, like, would have each one of the people at the ranch thinking the way he wanted them to, and if someone needed a compliment to be dependent on him, then he would compliment that person. If another person uh, always wanted to feel like they wanted to be accepted, he would put them down so they would try harder to be accepted. Uh, it was, you know, like I've tried to think, did he have like a superpower or, you know, was it some something else? And Really, I just think that he was just a really good con artist, and he didn't have that heart of material to con when you've got a lot of, uh, 
young children that are uh, dropping acid all of the time. Their minds are like, you know, clay anyway. So uh, that was mainly. But for, for myself, the attraction was like uh, his, he, he always emanated a certain amount of freedom. Towards the end, it wasn't. You know, he became uh, more intense and uh, he would shake more and he was more quick-minded or quick-tempered, I mean, and uh, then when the, he always said too how he uh, believed in truth and he represented truth and uh, once we went, went to court, suddenly we were supposed to start changing things and that kind of surprised me too. It, uh, it sh started to show another side of him. The only thing that I really could never answer is whether Charlie really believed what he told us himself or if he just did it as some say as a revenge against, you know, the system. I, I, I never would know that. No. Yes, it was supposed to, um, it was supposed to cleanse the whole world. And I, I honestly believe that. No, it's very real to me. It's very real to me at night when I'm uh, <clears throat> alone in my cell with my thoughts. And it's at that point that I, I don't try to block it out. I think that that's part of the, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that's part of the uh, hell that I'll have to live with forever. Uh, I... I work regularly on um, develop, developing a certain amount of peace with myself and with uh, God in that <clears throat> in that area. I don't I don't speak of it with anyone. I uh, it's just something that I work out with myself and with God. But it's. Well, I, I think that uh, he does, but I think the main thing is that, well, I have a very, per I'm, my religion is a really um, personal thing to me, but I, I feel comfort in knowing that I'm sharing it with, you know, God. I, I don't really ask myself too much if he forgives me or not, is that he helps me have strength to live through the rest of my life with that being part of it. Now? Yes. Yes, I do. But um, there's different kinds of crazy, I think. and. I think he was a very clever crazy. Do you know what I mean? Like there's some people that can't function when they're out of their minds or have nervous uh, conditions. And then there's ones who can use their illogic reasoning to accomplish certain things. And I think that he, he is that type. Van Houten was denied parole for the 14th time currently serving a life sentence for the 1969 murders of Leno and Rosemary LaVianca. They were killed in a horribly brutal fashion. In all, the Manson family was responsible for seven murders, the most well-known victim, actress Sharon Tate. While Manson's parole hearings are mainly theater, many other family members claim they are truly sorry and believe they've paid their debt to society. One of those is Leslie Van Houten. She spoke with us on the 25th anniversary of the murder. Later in the show, we'll talk with Patty Tate, Sharon Tate's sister. And we'll also hear from Leslie's father. But first, our 1994 conversation with Leslie Van Houten from the California Institute for Women in Corona, California. How long have you been here, this prison? I've been in this prison um, 
I've been back from bail 15, maybe 16 years. You were out for a while, right? Yes, I was. And um, I came to this prison in 71, I believe, on death row. And then in um, 76, I was given a reversal of my first trial. And I was out to court, and then I bailed, and then I came back. So. And found guilty after the second trial? Yes. Right? No, the third trial. Third I had trial. a hung jury in my second trial. There's, there's a death row? No, they've moved it. There used to be, but they've moved it up to another um, facility up north. After all this time, is it a total adjustment? Are you totally part of this community here? Yes. Yes. I mean, are, are you one of the leaders? Are you, uh, I mean, you're the, the veteran of this prison. Yeah, I'm one of the old timers. <laughs> um, I don't know if I would say I'm a leader. I try to, um, there's a lot of young women now coming in with very long sentences. And, you know, I try to carry myself in a way that I think gives them a chance to um, take seriously the years ahead of them. A lot of women coming in with long sentences. Yeah, I think so. Like 15 years? 15 to life. Crimes like? Life. Murder. Uh, a lot of assault. spousal killing? Yes. yes. And um, attempted murders. The, mostly those kind of crimes, I think, are what carry the long term. All right, we'll talk about a lot of things, including crimes. Let's go back to 25 years ago. 25 years ago tonight is when you were involved in a murder, right? Yes. Last night was the, the ninth would have been the tape killings, right? Yes. You were not at the tape, though. No. What were you doing in this whole thing to begin with? You were, what, how old, 19? Yeah. yeah. What were you, Leslie, what were you doing? I was, um, I had gotten to the ranch through other people that had been there and were driving up and down the coast. And prior to that, I was um, neck deep in the hippie movement. And I um, met these people. They said that they came from a commune in L.A. where they lived for the day and for the moment, and it was um, a lot of the leery kind of philosophy of be here now. And um, You were attracted to that? Sure. Huh? Where are you from? L.A. What did your father do? He's an auctioneer. Retired now. Do you remain close through all the years? Or was there a time of separation? The only time of separation was when I dropped out. My family were supportive when they you were caught and everything. With anger and resentment, you know. I remember um, one of the first visits with my mother. You know, I said to her that she'd probably be better off to just leave me alone because I had so easily left her life, and she just said that she wasn't made of that kind of stuff. You know. How many people were in the commune? There were. Probably, I'd say about 15 solid members, maybe 10 to 15 solid members, and then another 10 or so transients. About equal men and women? No, not at all. Much more women? Oh, sure. Why? Um, Manson um, worked women better. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm, I'm talking You were attracted to them. But well, looking back, there had to be some. I, I was the leader, mostly, right? Um, I, I wasn't one of the ones that was um, physically enamored with him. I was um, more caught and mesmerized by his um, mind and the things he professed. And Were many of the women physically yes. involved? You were yes. not physically? No. I Did he know. want you to be? No. He, I had come to the ranch through another man, Robert Beausoleil, and Robert Beausoleil was very important to Manson and there's a lot of speculation as to why but who knows. But Robert was your like lover? And so, yeah no. and so Manson always treated me in a way that I belonged to Bobby and you know now they were sort of used I think as bait. Well we don't understand about the period and you certainly can help. There were lots of cults, there were lots of communes, there were lots of dropouts. Mm -hmm. What led this one to be violent? Manson. Most were passive. Yes, Manson. What was his rationale? Or what would impress you? Where were you when the tape killings went on? You were with Manson, right? I was at the ranch, yeah. The others went out to do children. that. You knew what they were going to do? 
I knew that something was going to happen, but not specifically that night or that time or what. How did he condition them to accept the taking of someone else's life? He started off, um, the whole philosophy at the ranch, even in the um, gentler days, was um, to shed ourselves of our egos and to get rid of our own identity and to do what was then called become one with one another. And he would do this by um, assaulting our families, um, mimicking our morals, and all the things that we had been taught, because most of us were middle-class Anglos. Oh. And, um, but what took it the next step, Leslie? What, took what, what he started to do was to challenge, like, would you die for me? And then if we're all the same, you know, and this wasn't like in one, like I'm doing with you. This was this a very good process. When did he first say, to your memory, uh, let's go take someone's life? Very, not very long before the actual murders, he said that he uh, felt that he was going to have to take the lead and show the um, blacks how it needed to be done that they weren't doing it. Since then, I found out that he'd had some kind of a bum dope deal with somebody and had shot someone, so I assume. Do you know why they picked Sharon Tate? No. Is that purely it, bad luck? I know now that it had something to do with Terry Melcher. But I, at the time, each of us knew very little of what was going on. When they came back from the killing, did they describe them to you? Pat did the next morning. Were you distraught? No. I, I was. I was because it was sad and tragic that violence had to occur. So we went into the house, and I would say that that was when I first really understood what was happening. How many people were in the house? Two. A man and a woman. And were they tied up? Yes. Charles and Manson and the other friend had tied them up? Yes. And, um... They were very frightened. And Pat and I went in the kitchen. I think Tex said to get knives or... Anyway, we ended up in the kitchen getting knives. And Pat and I took Mrs. LaBianca into the bedroom. And... Um, was she screaming? Not at that point. Mostly, what's going on? What are you going to do? And um, I tried to hold Mrs. LaBianca down. And, and her head was covered with a pillowcase. I don't know if I did that. I could have. And um, she heard her husband dying in the living room. Who killed him? Tex. Stabbing him too? Yes. And when she heard, she struggled. And Pat went to stab her and the knife bent. And she was yelling out for her husband. And by that time, I was um, very torn inside. You know, I felt that I needed to really almost be a good soldier in this mission that had to be done and I, I was not. Also saying, why am I here? Or did you not question why you were I don't even know if I could have put that together. I wanted to get out of there as quickly how as possible. She, how was she killed eventually? She was stabbed. I, I went and I called Tex and I um, said that we weren't able to kill her. And then Tex went in the bedroom and Patton went into the living room and I went and I stood in the hallway and then Tex turned me around and he handed me a knife and he said, do something. Pat to leave with him to LA. And when he came back, he said that he had had a vision or an experience and that we would have to go back to LA and start preparing to save people from the revolution. So, and then it was just two weeks before this took place that he started talking about murdering people to instigate the revolution. Right. Beginning it ourselves. And did everybody kind of go along with that? Yes. Nobody ever questioned him? Uh, no. A few people left. Um, a woman named Ella left. I can't remember, but a few people left. Some of them left because they no, didn't... No one ever spoke out. Okay. After we were all arrested, lots of people said they didn't believe in it, but they didn't indicate that at the time. Okay, so a lot of people said they didn't believe he'd actually do it, that he would go through with it, is that what yeah, you Yeah, or that they believed him, or that they would have been participants, but that was 
not what they were saying at the time that it was going on. Okay. All right. Um, so the night that the group left for the Tate murders, were you aware that they were going? The only thing I had an indication that something was going to happen. Pat um, Krimwinkle and I were in a small room taking care of the children, and Manson came in and said to Pat to leave with him. And so only because the conversation had changed in the last few, like I say, the weeks before, I felt something was happening, but I didn't know specifically. Okay. Did you it ask, wasn't a plan. Did you ask to go? No. Okay. So then you stayed with the children, I, and that Miss Krenwinkel then left? Yes. Okay. All right. What happened when they returned? The next day, um, I, I'm a little cloudy on this part because I don't know from my direct memory I'm either going on things I testified to in the past or whatever I saw it on the news with Pat and I had walked with Pat Pat and I were very close at the time and um, she said that they were very young and it seemed wrong or not right mm -hmm. and I felt at that time that because she had gone and I felt that what we were doing was a mission that needed to be done, I felt that if they went again, that I wanted to go. I wanted to go and be a good soldier and surrender myself for what I believed in. So it didn't have watching this on the news because I remember, yeah. remember, I remember. You know, it, gosh, it just seemed so terrifying and so awful, and that all these people were brutally murdered. That didn't have an impact on you. You know, at that at that point, I was um, I was a shell of, of a person. You know, I saw it and it wasn't real. I don't think the impact of really what. The murdering was hit me until we were in the lobby and uncle home. It, it was like abstract concepts at that time. I, and there had been lots of talk prior to that by Manson mm -hmm. on, I think, desensitizing us as people. But as I recall in the news that was being done on that, there were bodies that were shown covered up and stuff like that. Yeah. And these were just totally innocent victims. It just, just had no, no effect. So then when did you know that, that they were going to go again the next night? I remember um, late evening, I think I was on the boardwalk, and Charlie, again, I, I'm telling you how I remember this part 25 years later. Parts of the crime are very clear to me that will never leave me.